So the idea of learning how stem cells um, are part of all the cells that create a tissue and how tissues create our bodies uh, can be described in terms of complexity theory, something that sounds complicated but is pretty simple. Um, it's how systems of interacting individuals, whether it's people walking down the street, ants in an ant colony, birds in a flock, or the cells in our bodies, um, organize themselves into larger scale structures, not because anybody has planned it, but just because the local interactions between them give rise to food lines of ants, um, patterns of people flowing down the sidewalk or like a flock of birds. And so we started uh, talking about stem cells and the cells that derive from them um, as very much like we talk about ants or humans self-organizing and thinking about it in terms of how the initial cells, the embryonic stem cells, become the embryo and give rise to the fetus and give rise to the postnatal child um, and then grow as you go through adolescence into an adult body. All of this is, at the cellular level, is just cells interacting with each other. No cell is thinking, how do I make a human? Um, they're just interacting with the cells nearby and somehow out of this, in a bottom-up way, uh, we have our bodies. So that immediately implies that you can have hierarchies of such systems. So we know that a community of humans form cities. You know, in New York, there's a, uh, where I live, there's a street um, where it's all Indian restaurants, 6th Street. No one zoned the city to make the Indian restaurants all be there. Yet somehow they just self-organized. And it turns out that if you look at small businesses in large cities, they actually do better business if they aggregate in small neighborhoods. And this just happens spontaneously, whether it's in Paris or London or Hong Kong, you find this phenomenon. And in New York, one of the examples is 6th Street Indian restaurants. So you get this sort of thing happening at the social level. Um, but the social level is constructed of humans. Um, again, like a flock of birds is constructed of birds. From a distance, a flock of birds looks like a thing. It may be moving, but it looks like a solid shape. But if you, someone says, oh, those are, that's a flock, you go, oh, right, of course, it's just a bunch of birds. But because of the way we're talking about biology, well, each bird, if you go up to the microscopic level, well, there's no bird, it's just cells. So this made it seem like cells are the fundamental unit that self-organize into biological structures. And that's the foundation of Western biology. When we talk about Western medicine and Western biology, what we're saying is that uh, live, all living things are made of cells. That's what defines Western. But the Greeks had asked, um, before we had microscopes, it was a philosophical question. So our bodies made of indivisible subunits, and they called them atoms. So it used to be that physics borrowed from biology, their terms. Um, or is it an endlessly divisible fluid continuum? Uh, can you just keep dividing and dividing? And then when they invented the microscope, they could see cell membranes and cell walls, which formed an empty box. Four walls, ceiling, and a floor. And we called them cells because they were like the cell of a monk or a prisoner. There was no furniture inside. And an empty box you can't subdivide. So the argument was settled. The body is made of atoms, and we'll call them cells. And 20 years later, they started figuring out what the furniture was. Golgi apparatus, nuclei, mitochondria, things like that. So I was thinking about this and asked the question, well, what if the technology had been different? Um, what if they had first seen the nuclei, not the cell membranes? Then they wouldn't have said, oh, the body is made of atoms. They would have said, oh, look, it's an endlessly divisible fluid. But there are these balls floating in it. So they would figure out what those balls were. And in the process, maybe 20 years later, they'd see the cell membranes. They wouldn't have said we were wrong. They would have said, oh, look, the fluid space it has divisions in it. And they're semi-permeable, so it's not... You know, so flow is a little bit more difficult, it's impeded. But they wouldn't have changed their model. The body would be fluid, and Western medicine and Western biology would be a fluid model, which turns out, incidentally, to be a much easier way to analyze and explain a lot of acupuncture data, which isn't anatomically based. And if you can't describe it in terms of anatomy, you can't describe it in terms of its building blocks, namely cells, which is probably why 
we've had such a hard time understanding what acupuncture is. So from that perspective, cells aren't a fundamental thing. At a lower level of scale, it's just biomolecules self-organizing themselves in the fluid. So are biomolecules a thing? Well, they're just self-organizing atoms. Well, what about atoms? Well, they're just self-organizing subatomic particles, which are smaller self-organizing smaller subatomic particles. The next level down, no one's sure what those are. They might be strings, they might be smaller particles, but there is nothing smaller because now we're down at the Planck length, um, 10 to the minus 36th meters, I think. I'm a liver pathologist. <laughs> Um, and at that level, they're not subdividing into smaller things, they're just coming in and out of existence. It's energy turning into matter which turns back into energy in what's called the quantum foam. And the details of that vary depending on what theory you have, but what physicists all agree on is, out of the vacuum, stuff is erupting. And that stuff, whatever it erupts into, whether it's strings or some other tiny thing, then self-organize into the larger scale subatomic particles, into bigger subatomic particles, into atoms, into molecules, into the universe. So suddenly the entire universe is a self-organizing system in which no thing actually exists as a thing. How this gets into consciousness studies, it comes in in a couple of ways. Um, first off, there's the idea that in quantum physics, the idea of an observer is essential to the outcome of any experiment. The minute an experiment, an observation is made in, a, in an experiment, a definitive outcome happens. But before that outcome happens, before it's observed, all the possibilities exist in a superposition. Everything is possible. So the classical Schrodinger's cat thing, the cat is both dead, dead and alive, in a superposition. Is that really happening? Is it really both dead and alive? You know, there are different philosophical interpretations, but the majority of the founders of quantum physics, and with shades of difference between them, felt that, and this is still the most robust approach to, to quantum physics, um, that consciousness is inherent in the universe coming into being at any given moment. So we have this self-organizing universe in which there is no thing that actually has inherent existence. And it's at its most fundamental levels, consciousness is what drives it, what creates it, um, what allows it to become what it is in each moment. Then you can't ask what, part, what any part of the universe is without asking what's its relationship to consciousness. And that seems to place the idea of consciousness at a lower level of scale than up here where our brain is creating the mind. So this is the, the essential divide philosophically, is does the brain create mind or does the universe create mind when it becomes sufficiently complex in structure? And some people would say only a human brain can do that, some people would say only a primate brain, some would say only a central nervous system, some would say only those with a nervous system, it doesn't have to be organized into a central nervous system. And some people, um, in particular um, uh, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela from Chile, had this idea of autopoetic theory. They were trying to ask the question, how do you define life? And what they came to is that the smallest thing that fulfills the criteria for being alive is a single cell. And that that is involved with having a boundary, defining inside and outside, and a certain kind of sensing that happens between inside and outside, and interactions across that boundary. Um, it's significantly more complex than that, but that's a, a reasonable um, approximation. And they said that that is the simplest form of mind in the same way that it is the simplest form of life. And a, an example that's commonly given is you have a paramecium, a single cell animal that has little hairs that act like oars and it's swimming towards up this way and it comes up against a boundary and if you watch it, it hits the boundary, will back up, change direction, hit the boundary again, back up, change direction until it finds a way to get around the boundary.
it looks from the outside like it has mind and it is finding its way past the boundary. What we know is happening is that it hits the boundary, the cell membrane deforms where it hits. That opens calcium channels in the cell membrane, calcium flows out, and that acts as a signal which turn get the flagelli to move in the opposite direction, so it backs up. The calcium diffuses away, they return to back to normal, but because they're, the water itself isn't static, there's a little turbulence. It's going to have a slightly different direction. So this idea of sentience, um, this sensing of the environment, and responding to the environment isn't machine-like. It's not like an air conditioner turning on and off. Um, the way the paramecium decided to make that change is that there were complex molecular interactions happening within the cell and with the cell membrane that caused calcium to flow out when the membrane deforms, etc. It's not always precisely the same. And in fact, you can describe that as a self-organizing phenomenon of the molecules that make up the paramecium inside. So you can define sentience as not only sensing the, in the, the world outside the organism and responding, because that could be like an air conditioner. An air conditioner senses the world and responds. But the internal processing of the information that's sensed happens according to the rules of a complex system. And one of the aspects of complex systems is there's always a little randomness in the system. That's how self-organizing systems can be adaptive and change if the environment changes because they're not machine-like. They're not going to do the same thing every time regardless of the environment. They're not too disordered because then there'd be no self-organization at all. It's got to be a low level of randomness. So we tied, this was work I did with uh, Minas Kafatos. We tied the idea of sentience to this internal processing like a complex system. And there had to be some level of randomness in that system. The question is, is it only a cell that does that? And it turns out DNA molecules do that in a simpler fashion, but they still do it. Some enzymes you can demonstrate do it. So are these the only things? Are these alive? Do these have mind? And technically speaking, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit complicated to do quickly in an interview, but in fact, you can find ever simpler but still concrete examples of this all the way down to the lowest levels of scale. And so it seems that sentience, as defined according to autopoiesis, doesn't stop at the cell. It's not that if it's alive, it has mind. If it has mind, it's alive. You can find evidence of even simpler mind further down. Calling that sentience has turned out to be very uh, sticky for a lot of people. Um, and we're willing to back off a bit. Currently, we're saying that what we're really talking about here, um, a better term for it at lower levels of scale is creative interactivity. Um, we're just coming up with labels. And the fact is, whether you call it sentience or creative interactivity or basketball, it's still, there isn't, at every level of scale, even down in the smallest quantum levels, there is this sensing of the environment and making a response um, that isn't always precisely the same. So there's a little bit of randomness in the system. So there can be room for creativity. And that that creative interactivity or sentience or basketball is the fundamental thing that allows the universe to self-organize. Because if things don't interact with each other, there's no self-organization. So this was actually how I started thinking more deeply about the, the consciousness aspects, this idea that you could trace sentience all the way down. Um, but then when you tie that together with quantum physics, you suddenly start to get a sense of a more seamless view of the universe. Um, I'm also a Zen student. I've been practicing for 25 years. And one can have uh, experiences in contemplative states that point in the direction also that, you know, consciousness isn't something being produced by here. I can experience my consciousness in other parts of my body. I mean, part of the practice, formal Zen practice, is focusing it in what's in Japanese called the hara, or your second chakra. Um, 
and it's actually feeling like your mind is situated there. Our habit of feeling like our minds are in our brains comes more because most of our sense organs are up here. It's not because our brain is here. Our face is here. Um, and you can even play games with experiencing it outside of your body. If you, you know, with, with enough practice, you can do that sort of thing if you feel like it. Um, so, but in, in still deeper states, you get a sense that, oh, actually what underlies the mind is something, some larger mind. Um, some people, some traditions will describe it as pure awareness, uh, the mind of clear light in Tibetan Buddhism, awareness of awareness. Um, so one can have these experiences that are well documented in many different cultures. Why is that not a viable hypothesis for where mind comes from? And in fact, in Western philosophy, it's not exactly um, an outsider idea either. A lot of what Plato was talking about, certainly Spinoza, um, Hegel, Kant, Whitehead, folding quantum physics into all of that with process theory. We're all suggesting in one way or another that consciousness is what things arise out of. It's not a product of the universe. It's, the universe is a product of that. Um, so uh, Minas and I are trying to formalize that view because it hasn't really been formalized in a contemporary and hopefully eventually this is his job, mathematical sort of way. Um, my inclination when you put all my streams of thought and experience together is that, yeah, I think actually consciousness is what comes first. Um, and everything arises from that. And I think that's a simpler way to look at the world. Um, the hard problem of consciousness, the, you know, what, how do qualia, how do I experience qualia like redness or the taste of a pizza um, or a happy memory? That's a problem if you think your brain has made your mind. But if you think that mind is what gave rise to the universe, then the entire universe is nothing but qualia. The problem sort of disappears because there isn't anything else. That's all anything is. Um, so in some ways I find that satisfying, although a lot of people find that really irritating.